Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Shiv. I'm part of a global accounts team at AWS. I'm a solutions architect. Um, so global accounts basically means uh, we work with MNCs who's, who have operations spread all over the world, and we work on very cool initiatives with our customers. So today I'm going to talk about my experience working with my customer, uh, building data lakes and machine learning uh, to turn their factories into smart factories. I will talk about, I have some content to share for around 45 minutes, and then I'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, my customer is also here, so if you have some questions, you can ask at that point. So before I start, I want to get an idea, feel for how many people, so as you know, smart factories, we, tr we are trying to build, uh, bring the IT and the OT world together. So if you have to classify yourself, uh, how many folks are from the OT world? Raise your hands. You work within the factory networks. Okay, just one person. Rest are from the IT world. Okay, cool. That makes it much easier for me because I'm also coming from an IT background. And during the last uh, couple of years, I have learned a lot on the OT side. So hopefully, we'll go through the journey together here. So let's first understand what is the smart factory vision, which everyone is talking about. Industrial revolution happened, the first industrial revolution happened in the 17th century, uh, when steam engines were invented. Basically, all the manufacturing now moved from handcrafted heirlooms to steam run engines. In the 19th century, the second industrial revolution happened when Henry Ford created the mass assembly line for making cars and uh, the advent of electricity helped. The other industrial revolution happened with the advent of computers. As computers started changing every industry, it impacted manufacturing also, automating a lot of different things. And now we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. So what is fourth industrial revolution? There are a lot of uh, big technologies which are coming into play. So we have cognitive computing, which is artificial intelligence. We have automation in terms of robotics and immersive compute. We have cloud computing and we have IoT. So as these technologies are impacting each and every industry, each and every function, then it's but natural that manufacturing will also change, benefiting from these technologies. So that's what basically the fourth industrial revolution is all about. So when you talk about what the smart factory vision is, I think the end goal is, is pretty cool, right? Perfect exchange of information between products and machines uh, so that all the operations happen perfectly. There is no breakdown and you can build a lot of things at the real time. Uh, like my customer also makes something called 3D printers. I would imagine that if that becomes the manufacturing machine, that's the ultimate smart factory, we can control a lot of things. So the vision of smart factory is grand. Now, how do we bring down to reality and start executing on it on a project basis? So first of all, we have to get everyone excited, right? The business folks should be excited uh, to invest in this initiative, they had to go and convince the CFO. Uh, so the vision is that manufacturing will, will not just be a cost center, just executing on what product or ma uh, the design folks or the marketing folks ask them to make. It will be a capability-centric organization. They will start using things like machine learning, as we'll talk about a couple of cases, and get the whole organization ex excited. So that's why smart factory is very important for uh, some of the stakeholders which we talk to. Now getting one level deeper, how, how it will impact people working in manufacturing. For plant manager, we assume with the advent of smart factory, when you have perfect information exchange and you're able to control machines uh, uh, in an ideal manner, just give the job and it gets printed, for example. Again, my ideal machine is a 3D printer. Then you will do build to order. Build to order already happens for small manufacturing, but how, how do we do it for mass manufacturing? For production managers, we are going to increase the yield and throughput. So what is the yield? Basically, if you have an assembly line, 
then the good parts coming out of it divided by the total parts is the yield. What is the yield? What is throughput? That's the parts coming out of the assembly line for a given time period. So how do we increase this? It's but natural we have to reduce the downtime of all the machines and the assembly line, and we have to reduce the part shortages. So if you are able to do that, then production manager gets benefit. For quality managers, we have to improve the quality with low overhead. And it's interesting because within my customer also, when I talk to different uh, factory owners, they might have different uh, drivers for why they want to do smart factory. So one of the operations I talked to, quality was the most important thing uh, to them. They felt that their yield and throughput is good. Uh, so how to improve the quality over assembly line where the part is going from one uh, ma uh, machine to other is uh, something which we'll do with smart factory. And final person I will talk about is the inventory manager. Uh, so we will minimize inventory on all stages. And um, I guess if, if, if you can't uh, imagine how that will happen, it's basically better inventory forecasting with some of the announcements which we saw uh, this week. So now uh, once we identified what are, the, what are the end results which we are going to do for various personas, then we start, uh, sat together and started designing the solution components which we need uh, to achieve this. We definitely needed a data lake, right? The perform, uh, if you need information exchange and information driven decisions, then all decision, all data which is impacting a particular factory needs to be at one place. Prior to the creating the data lake, it was in a data warehouse. So definitely the streaming data from the machines could not land there. And a lot of uh, tools and technologies which came into being uh, in the last few years, those, were, those, those could not be used with the traditional data warehouse. So creating a data lake was a no-brainer that we had to do that. Once we had the data lake, we had to get data into the data lake so that we have to build data ingestion and analytics. Uh, data ingestion is basically two so kind of sources. If you're familiar with Lambda architecture, there will always be a streaming pipeline and there would be a batch pipeline. So we classify our data sources into these two pipelines and uh, uh, do the work accordingly. Uh, this is the term uh, my customer uses, command and control center. Uh, it is the brain of the whole smart factory. It's basically where all the data gets, first of all, you see it in a, uh, in a nice visual manner. Uh, based on role-based dashboards. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll start executing a lot of automation flows. So the control part of it is actually go and stop the machine or change the uh, parameter settings based on what you're seeing from the analyzed data. Then machine learning models need to be created. Uh, as we all know that um, all business functions at this point are are trying to find out ways to use machine learning. Everyone uh, agrees with the promise of machine learning. So we have to talk to them and after numerous discussions, we identified few models uh, which will be, we will start with. So I'll discuss some of those. So these are the four components which, which is a part of this project. Uh, the over-encompassing project is much broader. They first of all have to make the machines much more smarter in terms of uh, robotics and all that. Uh, huge uh, investment needs to flow in the connectivity, but I'm not talking about those aspects of it. So I think uh, if everyone is familiar with, uh, uh, most of you are from the IT world, then hopefully you are familiar with what a data lake is. But, um, but I'll just uh, again re-emphasize because uh, it, it's, it's important to point out few things which you need to do well while building the data lake. First of all, it would be a store for all structured and unstructured data, right? So you have to design it in a manner um, that uh, it, it, can, uh, and, uh, it can, it has a storage for all that, and then it has a way of tools so that you can analyze that data combined together. You have to put proper governance together. Um, so I'm very excited by some of the announcements uh, this week from the Glue team. We need to catalog all the data because we can't build all the use cases from day one, but once a good catalog is available on top of the data lake, then analysts can start working on that uh, themselves. And then of course the data lake should be able to 
The final thing is it should be available to machine learning pipelines. It should be available to tools like QuickSight so you can visualize and act on the data. Uh, so that's data lake, very important if you, are, if you have uh, isolated data stores. It's very important for you to bring that all together if you are trying to uh, do a smart factory kind of initiative. So uh, what were the unique challenges which we faced uh, while building this data lake, uh, which is very uh, particular to the manufacturing industry? First of all, different protocols, right? We all know that machines are vary from um, the, because of the age, because of the kind of operation they do. They talk different protocol from Modbus. Uh, some of the machines, modern machines might uh, make, for example, 3D printer can make a rest call, but old machines won't uh, be able to do that in the manufacturing floor. Um, so you need to basically have a, a way or how you can get data from different protocols and formats. Uh, Modbus is a popular one which we had to deal with uh, into uh, the data uh, ingestion pipeline. The next aspect is security. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you, but typically the manufacturing network is separate from um, the IT network. And people are very cautious on opening the manufacturing network, right? They don't want their machines to be taken over by somebody else. Uh, that's the ultimate fear they have. And they don't want malware to be introduced in the manufacturing network and manufacturing line be stopped. So security is another key challenge which you have to deal with uh, while creating a data lake for smart factories. Finally, uh, performance of closed loop systems. So uh, because a lot of these ha is, uh, are brownfield implementations, you can't really change the machine. Sometimes you are just putting an adapter attached to the machine. Uh, but you have to design for a scenario where you would have, for example, 3D printer. Uh, then you can control each and every aspect of the operations. Um, so you, the architecture which you create, it needs to be flexible enough that once your machines become capable, you can start controlling more and more operations from the command and control center. Um, so uh, if I bring it to a lower level, uh, folks who are familiar with Kinesis, it's a, uh, it's a data streaming analytics technology. Um, so a lot of people use that for streaming telemetry data. But it's, it's only one way. It's bringing data to the cloud. So if you want to actually do some operation on the machine, then we have to introduce IoT services uh, so that we can actually control the machines. So I'll uh, start uh, getting one level deep into the, uh, what we did uh, especially for this project on the various solution components which I mentioned. Data ingestion and analysis. So these were our data sources. Uh, the planning data was coming from SAP system. Uh, the supplier was uh, uh, giving us Excel of uh, uh, the components which they ship. The manufacturing was basically uh, small manufacturing in the sense we just personalize the component which we get from the supplier. And then we put it on a uh, another piece of hardware to create the final assembly. Um, so this, this was uh, uh, obviously changes based on uh, uh, your factory or the supply chain which you are dealing with, but this, this is an example of what we had to deal with. So as you can see, the data sources are varied and they are sending data in different formats. Uh, the planning and the supply data is coming in terms of batch load, but the manufacturing and assembly data has to come from streaming data from the machines. So in order to build, so I'll talk about the two flows. Uh, first, the streaming data, and then the batch data, what we did. So for the streaming data, in order to get data out from the shop floor, manufacturing floor, onto the cloud, uh, I hope you are familiar with a service called AWS Greengrass. Um, it basically gets deployed on a gateway, or if your machine, again, uh, uh, is powerful enough, like a big G MRI machine, then I actually run a green grass on the machine itself. So green grass is a software platform. Uh, that platform allows you a flexible way to create your own adapters, which can talk to different machine, uh, talking different protocols, or you uh, use some of our out-of-the-box adapters. That platform allows you to write lambdas, 
which basically you can do filtering and aggregation if you don't want to send all the data back. And that platform also allows you to run machine learning inferencing, uh, which we'll talk about how we're planning to use it. Now, Greengrass collects the data and sends it uh, to what is called IoT Core. IoT Core is basically important in the sense that it's a pub-sub kind of communication. So we can't rely that the manufacturing network uh, uh, will always be connected to uh, the IT network. Uh, some remote manufacturing, it might go down. So at that point, you should not lose data. So that's why this kind of uh, communication mechanism is very important. Then it will send the data to IoT Core, and IoT Core can route it to different places. So for our project, we use Kinesis. Uh, Kinesis Analytics, I'll tell you some of the examples of what we are trying to do, the kind of analysis we are trying to do on the streaming data. Uh, but uh, with the recent announcement of so many different IoT services, you might have to look at those services also and see, for example, uh, IoT Analytics, maybe that might be applicable. But the uh, beauty of this architecture is uh, definitely can extend. So if you want to use IoT Analytics, we can use it. So once we have done the, done the analysis in terms of basic aggregation and whatever operation we want to do, we want to persist the data. Uh, so we use DynamoDB to persist that data. So this is uh, the ho how the whole architecture looks like. Uh, for people who haven't used uh, these t services, you might, uh, you might question why we have so many different boxes. Why not just one box for Kinesis? But most of the AWS services are purpose built for one particular task, it's very easy to tie them together. So you have to tie Kinesis data stream to data analytics, and then it has, Lambda has to basically write to DynamoDB, it cannot write directly. But it's very quick to tie all these services together, and that's why it's easy to change this. If, for example, if you want to use IoT analytics in this architecture, it would be an easy change. So now uh, let's look at green grass a little more in detail. Um, so again, uh, for people who are not familiar, uh, most important, you can always write custom code, right? If, you're, if your machine or your gateway supports Linux, you can write custom code. But how to make it a scalable architecture, that's what Greengrass allows you to do. Uh, so first of all, you are writing Lambda. Hopefully most of you guys in IT are familiar with Lambda. So even for things which are running in the factory floor, you are writing Lambda, so that's a big win. Um, and then it's, it has this PubSub MQTT-based architecture. So the same stream coming from uh, one machine can be written to two different topics. For example, two different kind of sensors. And uh, different things can be subscribing to it. So that way, is also, it's very extensible. So you can see that we have two machines sending uh, data from the PLC. We have written a Lambda adapter to convert that PLC data into MQTT. And then we write to two different topics. Uh, from where the core can uh, subscribe and get that message. Now, this is a slide on AWS connectivity. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, people might be paranoid that is it safe to open your manufacturing network to uh, AWS cloud? So, I would say this is no different from what we have been doing. Uh, if, we, if we do it the right way. So people hopefully in the cloud world are familiar with the concept of DMZ. These are subnets which basically you, uh, you open ports in a very um, isolated manner that you allow only particular kind of traffic to come in and out. So what we'll do is we'll deploy green grass in such a manner so that it can get traffic from the manufacturing industrial network and then it can write traffic to the enterprise network. And that's basically just MQTT over 443 and 8443 ports. And once the enterprise, uh, the uh, data reaches the enterprise network, then hopefully your IT network, uh, your on-premise network is already connected to AWS through DX or uh, VPN. So that's how a very secure communication can happen between the manufacturing network and the IT network. Now let's look at, uh, so I, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, we are getting data from Greengrass into IoT Core and that routes to Kinesis. So what was the purpose of routing the data into Kinesis Analytics and uh, what it is doing? Um, sorry for being an eye chart, but 
first of all, people write complex jobs. It's difficult to maintain. When you are trying to do analysis on streaming data, uh, it can be a difficult uh, query if, if you don't have the right tool. So here, what we are trying to do is, because we are getting too rapid data, multiple data points per second to calculate the yield, we wanted to do it over five minute interval. So we are basically summing up uh, the good parts and the bad parts in a sliding window of five minute interval. So we have, we have converted the data which was coming, multiple data points per second into a five minutes interval. Uh, so that we can put it in DynamoDB and put dashboards on top of it. So this is one example of what you can do in Kinesis. Uh, this is another example, uh, which is very powerful. So if you have sensor data coming in, right, uh, multiple sensor, and they are writing to one Kinesis data stream, now you have a stream, and you want to detect anomalies on that stream. Uh, so again, instead of writing complex uh, jobs yourself, you can basically call this random cut forest API, which is available within Kinesis Data Analytics, and you can find outliers within the data stream which you are, uh, which you are getting. Uh, so very powerful way of finding that something is wrong with that machine if you get uh, data anomalies. And this um, random cut forest is a very powerful algorithm. If you want to change it, for some, as we all know, machine learning models are based on your data. If it doesn't work for your data, just open up SageMaker and change that model, and then uh, recreate the model and use it here again. So it's very powerful that way. So these are examples of analysis which we want to do on the streaming data. Now, let's move on to the batch flow. So the main challenge, I guess, is uh, these are the corporate IT system, right, SAP. So of course, you have to work with your corporate IT team uh, to get the SAP data extracted. But once the data is extracted, uh, we'll just copy that data to S3. We are not doing any transformation. Uh, this is just, the, we want to make sure that all data sources which we have are sending the raw data to the data lake. And then we'll do the transformations after that. So we also want the manufacturing flow data to come here because that's more for historical analysis. If you want to uh, write a prediction model to, uh, for a machine maintenance, then you want our historic information also, uh, which is not uh, happening in the real time flow uh, uh, for uh, generating alerts and all that. So luckily, again, it's very easy to send the same stream which is coming from machines. Uh, one part of the stream will go to uh, DynamoDB but the other part can go via Kinesis Data Firehose to the data lake. The technology, which, uh, the service which we use to do transformation, um, a lot of these transformation on big data, as you know, is based on Spark. So we used uh, Glue, or at least planning to switch to Glue because we might have used data pipeline, and uh, Glue came out after that. So Glue is basically transient Spark clusters. You don't have to worry about uh, creating and managing those clusters yourselves. And then uh, Glue is also what you use to create the catalog. So it's, it's very important to get used to Glue when, when you're creating a data lake. Then uh, after we have done the transformation, uh, we send the data into another S3 bucket, and then people can uh, query that data using Athena. Um, so here it was interesting that first we thought that we'll just use S3 as the final output for most analysis, uh, but then we realized that we have to combine with other data, and because of other reasons, we also want to introduce Redshift in the architecture. Uh, Redshift is a data warehouse, so again, you can put a lot of huge data there, it gets stored in a columnar fashion, and uh, it becomes easy to analyze, especially with tools like uh, the dashboard visualization tool, which I'll show you. And then some of this data also needs to go to DynamoDB. Remember, we are building the real-time dashboard on top of DynamoDB. So whatever data you need uh, for that dashboard needs to uh, reside in DynamoDB. So this is how the batch flow looks like. Uh, you just copy the data to S3, ten, uh, tens of technologies how to copy data to S3. 
And after that, as soon as it lands in S3, you can spin a, a glue job, do different kind of transformations, and put it to different so, uh, targets uh, based on your use case. Now, this is an example of analysis, which I showed you an example of analysis which we wanted to do on the streaming data. Uh, this is an example of analysis which we wanted to do on uh, the batch data. Uh, so this is huge amount of data. When you are storing this huge amount of data uh, in S3 and using tools like Athena, you typically want to convert this data into parquet format, which is a columnar format, much more optimized way. You can compress the data, um, and the queries will run fast, uh, and that's important if you're dealing with big data. So uh, very easy. To, uh, Glue al al uh, already comes with these kind of templates, but you can write your own uh, Sparks uh, jobs. Uh, to create these kind of transformations. This is an example of how we created an Athena table on top of uh, the transformed S3 data. Uh, so it's basically Hive DDL. Uh, you, can, uh, you can write your own crawlers, or you can use some of the out-of-the-box crawlers. You point it to S3 bucket, and it creates table definition for that S3 data. So now your analysts are, remember your users are business analysts in manufacturing world who won't get into complex technologies, but hopefully they can write SQL queries on top of this C uh, uh, SQL data uh, for analysis. Now we'll talk about uh, command and control center. Um, so we, we covered the data lake, um, uh, we covered data ingestion, different kind of data ingestion and analysis for streaming data, for batch data. Now let's look at what's happening in the brains of the whole smart factory. So this is the end-to-end -end view of your whole smart factory, right? Um, so it has to be role-based, and then you have to create whatever charts that role needs, whatever alerts they need on that uh, dashboard. And then uh, ability to take action is very important. Again, it's a closed-loop system. We are not creating uh, analytics for the stake of uh, analytics, we have to actually do action on that. So we have to automate a lot of action. So the uh, architecture should allow that. So some of the examples of what we can build on uh, this for the plant manager, we can show him the production compared to actual. For inventory manager, we can show him the current and the predicted inventory. Um, how are you getting the predicted inventory? You are using machine learning models. So the next section, we'll talk about machine learning. The pipeline should be able to write uh, to a uh, data source from where this dashboard can read to show current and predicted in inventory at each stage. Uh, it's very important that you build uh, uh, something which is useful to the business. For some uh, business folks, it might be important to monitor inventory at each workstation in an assembly line. For some, it might be just the whole assembly line inventory uh, the raw parts and the finished parts, what uh, uh, they care about. So you have to talk to the business analysts and work with them in order to build this kind of dashboards. Then for the production manager, we can definitely show yield. And if there is yield is, uh, there is an anomaly in the yield, then we can highlight it uh, so they get to know before. So when we started choosing the technology which we wanted to use to build this command and control center, uh, we went with uh, creating a basically a web application. Um, some of the traditional BI tools um, were not data-driven, uh, self-refreshing kind of architecture which we wanted. This is uh, uh, the brains of the whole operation. It should be very dynamic. So we created a web application for it. And for the charts, we basically used JavaScript uh, we use something called Plotly, which is a popular way of creating data-driven charts. I already mentioned uh, DynamoDB is the data store. So we are creating a highly responsive web application, and DynamoDB gives us the performance and scale uh, which we need. Then we have an architecture to control the actual uh, machine from the command and control center, either in an automated manner or uh, uh, someone taking an action to actually change the uh, machine operation. Then command and control center is showing a lot of predict predictive things. Um, so how are we getting that predictive things? We, I, as I'll talk about, we'll create those models in SageMaker, 
we'll expose those endpoints, and then we need to be able to call from this web application uh, to do real-time prediction or do batch prediction and populate uh, DynamoDB so we can show it on the dashboard. Um, so this is how the overall architecture looks like. Uh, it's, so as you can see, command and control center is basically a web application running on EC2. Um, it's controlling the actual machines uh, through IoT core. Uh, the architecture is very simple that if you want to stop the machine, change some parameter setting, you write a message to the MQTT topic on IoT core. Uh, and then the green grass reads from IoT core. It has an adapter which is written to talk to that machine and it will uh, do the operation on the machine. And SageMaker is basically exposing the endpoints which we can call from the command and control center. Now this is uh, what, what we gathered. Initially we started uh, with just building the command and control center, but uh, you will find very quickly that the number of charts which you want, uh, the business wants, that keeps on increasing and that keeps changing. So the only way to uh, meet some of those requirements is you give the capability to them to build their own charts. You basically create a nice data catalog uh, so that they can actually build their own charts. And the tool to uh, do that would be QuickSight. And QuickSight can read data uh, from S3 directly uh, or from Redshift uh, via, uh, from uh, S3 it can uh, read uh, directly uh, using Athena. QuickSight is also integrated with IoT analytics. So another service uh, which you might want to look, like, uh, look at if you are doing an implementation now, IoT analytics gives a lot of value add and IoT analytics can create a data stream which you can consume from uh, QuickSight to create the visualizations. So that was command and control center. Now let's look at the final solution component which we worked on, and those are the machine learning models. So let's first look at what is the process of creating machine learning. Um, so you might have heard that SageMaker is targeted for both developers and data scientists. And we definitely saw that uh, in this project. We were talking to both data scientists and developers and we were bringing them together uh, with the help of this ma managed machine learning platform. So of course, um, the data scientists, right, they are, they are good with algorithms. They have been writing algorithms for quite some time. So they might not be impressed with that aspect of algorithm, uh, SageMaker. They are more interested in how do they create a hosted endpoint which can scale. Uh, uh, whereas the developers, they are coming from traditional BI dashboarding world, how to write basic regression classification model they can get up to speed very quickly uh, with SageMaker. So the first use case which we wanted to look at is predictive maintenance. So there are different kind of machines. So in our case, we are, there's a huge oven which, is, which has a lot of sensors which is sending data. Um, similarly, as you know, 3D printers uh, has uh, a lot of uh, sensors embedded within that which can send data. So based on the class of machine which you have, you will have to write different models, right? Uh, these models will typically fall in two categories. Uh, either it's a binary classification model, which you will say that in a given uh, period, for example, over the next seven days, this machine will fail or not fail. Um, so you can take uh, appropriate action. Or you can create a regression model, which will say that what is the remaining uh, life left for this machine, so the, actually you can replace that part or not. So uh, in order to write these models, again, uh, because the data scientists uh, were already familiar with uh, some of these algorithms, um, they, they, they used uh, some of those algorithms, but they can always compare the results uh, with linear learner, which is out of the box available in uh, SageMaker. So you can throw your data at linear learner and it can do both these kind of predictions uh, and then actually you can compare which model is better. For some of these use cases, we want to actually deploy the model endpoint uh, at, uh, at the machine. So especially in case of 3D printer, we want to uh, deploy the inferencing to happen right at the edge. We don't want to send uh, a huge amount of data back to the cloud. Uh, so that, that architecture is also possible because SageMaker can deploy 
on the edge. The second model uh, which uh, we basically are in the process of implementing are computer vision based quality inspection. So right now in the uh, shop floor, there's a person who inspects visually every part which is coming out. Uh, so we want to create a model, uh, deploy a model, which will at least do the first level of inspection, and then it can flag the parts which the human person should uh, check. So obviously it will increase uh, productivity, bring down the cost of quality inspection uh, in a very impactful manner. Uh, the model algorithm which we use for this, again, uh, SageMaker comes with um, a CNN-based algorithm for image classification. So we are using that as one data point, uh, one uh, way of creating uh, this model. And then the data scientist created another model using TensorFlow. Uh, so we can compare the results of those two models and uh, choose a model which we want to deploy. When this, when this inference endpoints get deployed, it gets deployed inside a Lambda. So as you can see, uh, we will have, we are, we are talking to the, I guess, the recent initiative where we are, we have a structured program of classif uh, uh, going through the various hardware makers and we uh, invite them to join our IoT partnership when they have gone through all that vigorous testing of how green grass will work, how ma uh, machine learning inferencing will work. So, now we are in the process of shortlisting that partner for the hardware we can use in the factory floor. Um, and uh, when, this, when this gets deployed, there will be two streams of data. Uh, so one stream will go directly, the device stream will go directly, and the other stream is generating alerts uh, from the machine learning running uh, in the green grass in the factory itself. And it's uh, highlighting the parts uh, which might need further inspection. And the third and the final uh, model which we want to work on is uh, forecasting. Um, so here, as we all know, that traditional time series forecasting, whether using regression or ARIMA, they have been around for some time, uh, but, but they are not meeting the re needs of the smart factory, uh, at least, where we are doing a lot of build to order. So here we want to use deep learning neural networks which are available. Uh, so we started playing, uh, seeing if deep AR can be used, which is again an algorithm which is available in uh, SageMaker. Uh, but now we want to use Amazon Forecast, which was announced uh, recently. So we will use our time series data and try to uh, use Amazon Forecast to see if it can give a more uh, accurate prediction of the demand and then uh, we plan inventory accordingly. So again, uh, this is definitely work in progress, machine learning. If I have to pick uh, the most complex part of this, all the four solution components which we build uh, is the machine learning models. We went uh, a lot of time back and forth, and the space keeps changing a lot, uh, but, but we definitely have uh, some direction on where we want to go, and uh, work is happening there. So, uh, I'll put together an overall architecture for you. Uh, the danger is uh, this is not a reference architecture for any factory, right? But you can pick and choose components uh, based on your use case and what you think is important to you. But uh, this is at least what came together for us. Uh, so we have the streaming data coming from Greengrass, which we are deploying in the factory gateway. Uh, this data, uh, it's a data collection point for all the machines which are there in that factory floor. They are sending the data to IoT Core. And from IoT Core, we are routing the message to Kinesis. And Kinesis, we are writing SQL queries. I showed a couple of examples of queries where we are aggregating uh, to calculate the yield and then anomaly detection. Then it's writing via Lambda to DynamoDB. And that basically becomes the data store from where the whole command and control center uh, uh, application gets its data from. Command and control center is able to reach out and control the operation of the factory machines uh, through the IoT core. So this is our streaming pipeline. And then we have our batch pipeline. We get the S3 data, we get the supplier data. Uh, it was interesting, uh, yesterday they announced uh, 
the managed service for FTP. SF, uh, so that, that is definitely one something which we can use for getting the supplier data into S3. Then the transformation happens in Glue. Um, again, it's transient spark clusters. Uh, to the extent possible, we don't want to manage all these machines. Uh, so we ha our, this customer has huge implementation of AWS, and I have seen where people struggle with trying to size databases if they are not using managed services. So uh, to the extent possible, at least for this initiative, we are trying to use managed services. Then um, Glue is writing to Redshift and S3 from where we, get, we can expose that data to the business analysts so they can actually create their own dashboards beyond the structured one which we are giving in command and control center. Machine learning, again, uh, the pipeline is there that in SageMaker we'll create the models using the data which is available in S3. Uh, we'll create the endpoints which can be called from command and control center uh, to actually show the predictive part of uh, the graphs and dashboards which we are creating. Uh, some implementation advice. I would advise based on our interaction that definitely start small. You, if this, these are a lot of new services which you are introducing to the business, um, then you have to start from one critical product line. That's what we did. Uh, or one factory. And prior to that, I, 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 I guess I didn't put it, but it's very important to sell the vision to the executives. Uh, smart factory is a huge investment. Um, so uh, uh, we talked about some of the vision and the value adds creating to various personas. It's important to communicate that to all the executives so you get proper funding to do this over multiple years. Uh, in the spirit of working backwards, uh, don't start from collecting the data points, uh, but start from what is the end uh, role-based dashboard, charts, alerts, which you want to create, and then work your way backwards to how do I create that uh, based on the data points which I have. So, for example, if I need some data from some machine and that sensor is not there, then you have to install that sensor to get data because you want to generate that alert. Machine learning can definitely happen in parallel. So you are creating all this pipeline and you can create command and control dashboard. The predictive part of command and control center can work can happen in parallel, where you basically uh, engage the data scientist and the developers who are interested in doing this, uh, and they can work on the data in parallel and start pushing some of those models to the command and control center. You have to involve uh, cyber security or uh, whatever the CSO organization you have, because they need to be comfortable with, uh, with uh, connecting the manufacturing network uh, to the IT network and then to eventually to the uh, AWS cloud. So you have to review all that. You have to go through the security which you have. Uh, for example, we didn't cover Greengrass security, but uh, it's certificate based authentication. You create authorizations based on policies. So all that you have to review with them and they need to get comfortable and then they will let you go. And finally, you might need to uh, engage some partners or ProServe. When we started building uh, this data lake uh, for manufacturing, um, we found that not many consulting partners had that kind of experience. Uh, so we found actually a partner who has done this kind of data lake for gaming companies. As you know, gaming companies rely on very fast operational decision during the game. So they had built a huge data lake for a gaming company and we chose that partner uh, for this initiative. And then once you have to scale it to multiple hundreds of factories, hundreds of uh, critical uh, supply chain, then you might also uh, benefit from using AWS ProServe who has done it with other customers. So that's what we are doing. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, in terms of what other sessions, of course, uh, these sessions already happened, but you can go to YouTube, hopefully. The first session is interesting. He's actually giving you cloud formation templates uh, to create a manufacturing network, a DMZ, uh, and uh, uh, AWS network. So you can actually go mimic that whole scenario and uh, play around with that. 
And then he talks a lot about the OT world, uh, different protocol conversions and all that. Uh, the second session was more of a vision about value chain, uh, what we are thinking in future. Uh, and the f third was a hands-on workshop, so we didn't do that. Uh, it won't be on YouTube. At this point, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, and uh, Vibin is also here, so he can also take some questions. Anyone working on this initiative? Or can you share where, where you are? Yeah. Um, okay. So say, say, oh, hi, there we go. All right. So say you have, um, like, you can use Kinesis data streams if to do something that's like temporal windowing. Um, that can kind of like help you with anomaly detection. For, you can do alerting, but you need to be able to look over long periods of time. Um, we found that some of our clients were actually relying on these alerts in a mission critical way for like safety purposes or for control purposes. They want to discard bad parts. Um, so they need to be able to look at like a window of time series data. And you can do this like on the cloud with uh, Kinesis data, like streaming analytics. But how would you be able to do that on the edge? Like if, if it, like, because Lambda, you can kind of only act on like one point at a time. Is there any way to do like temporal streaming analytics on the edge with AWS products? Yeah, so uh, obviously you need a time series database to store that information and then you have to create models. So. Uh, I don't believe in the announcement we announced a time series database for Edge. Um, so maybe you will have to, because it's a Linux platform, um, so you will have to deploy some of those so software components yourself to actually create a data store if you want to do that at Edge. Cool, cool. Um, I think that's it, actually. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So uh, I'd just like to uh, add something to uh, Shiv's answer. So we had that same problem. Uh, one thing we uh, could do was in Greengrass itself, it doesn't provide any persistent store, but you could have a lightweight DB on the Greengrass device core itself where you store data and then run analytics offline on it. Yeah, so I mean, so it's it's about scheduling between various topics into one core. Have all of this bring it into one core, but then you know, core is not uh, actually defined for that specific use case where it is meant for analysis, right? So it's more about collecting ingestion, ingesting, and then sending it out. So, but yeah, time series. This is the only thing. I mean, they don't provide anything out of the box. It's something we have to install on the green grass core. Yeah, but I won't be, because uh, I think they they definitely have the vision for green grass to do much more things. Um, so let's keep a watch on this space. All right. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, we'll wind it up. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And don't uh, forget to give your reviews here because we want to create these kind of solutions, overall solution-based sessions more. Um, so please uh, give your review here. Thank you.